Welcome, friends, to today's sermon, where we'll be exploring the life-changing message of putting off the old, putting on the new. Based on the teachings in Colossians and other scriptures, we'll discuss the importance of transformation, renewal, and seeking the things above as we walk in our new life in Christ. Get ready to be inspired and encouraged on this journey of spiritual growth. Putting on the new. Literally putting off the old person we were before we met Christ, before we received Him, and putting on the new person. It's a process. And so I want to read beginning in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, down through verse 11 this morning. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once, notice that, past tense, walked when you lived in them. But now, present tense, you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Verse 9, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who image of him who created him where there is neither Jew nor Greek uncircumcised or circumcised nor uncircumcised barbarian or Scythian slave nor free but Christ is all and in all amen, amen. let's pray god as we come to your word today Open our eyes and ears of understanding that we might receive and that we might take this mirror that describes and Lord, look at ourselves and ask ourselves, how are we doing? If we name the name of Christ today, how are we doing in putting off the old person and putting on the new? And you give us uh, uh, a list here to go by and help us, Lord, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, talking about putting on and putting off as far as clothes go, uh, we know a lot of individuals that we recognize them by their uniform, by the clothes they wear. Uh, If you're in the military, you recognize it. If you are a policeman, you recognize it. Uh, Doctors and nurses and EMTs and, and firefighters. Yesterday, uh, I seen uh, I seen some of the coronation of of King Charles. You saw about every uniform <laughs> that you could imagine, about every style of dress regarding the religious, uh, you know, garb, and and then the kingly garb, and the queenly garb, and the prince garb, and all these different things, and all of the you know lettuce they were wearing, and all the medals that they were wearing, and all of this stuff, and uh, of course you know a lot of in. Uh, Office wear. Uh, in fact, there used to be a time when they've had casual Friday because it was expected of people in the office to, you know, to dress up. And uh, I know in still in some of the offices, obviously lawyers' offices, they, you know, wear a suit and a tie and they wear that into the courtroom. And I heard about one particular episode where this a lawyer was taking his client into the courtroom and he was dressed to the max, you know, he had all the you know, this fancy pinstripe suit and the silk tie and the cuff links, you know, with his initials on them and everything and uh, and his Rolex watch on his hand, you know, you got it, you flaunt it. And his client, he said, how do you get away with dressing so fancy and more or less flaunting your way, your wealth? And the lawyer said, well, haven't you heard of power of attorney? And uh, the client said, well... I I guess it just goes to show that clothes make the man. And the lawyer replied and he said, do you know what kind of clothes a lawyer wears? And he said, no. And he said, I'll tell you, lawsuits and legal briefs. So there was uh, one of our own original individuals from this state named Mark Twain. He had a lot of pithy sayings. 
And I want to share one of them that he had. He said, clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society. Now I want to tell you something. He was wrong. Abs a naked man had the greatest impact on the world the world has ever seen. And his name was Jesus Christ. His name was Jesus Christ. He wasn't clothed on the cross. He was bearing our shame, our nakedness. Jesus did. Nothing covered because he was covering our sins through his blood and through uh, being that second Adam and taking what uh, Adam and correcting everything Adam had messed up. To put us back in our context of where we were last week, back in Colossians, we had this charge from Paul. He said, seek those things which are above where Christ is. And then the very next verse, again, he says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So I share that this morning because now he's saying, hey, you've got Jesus in you. You got to get your mind off of the earth, get it up on heaven. So if it's on heaven, how do you behave on earth? Do you behave like a lost man, a lost person, or you save like, or do you live like a Christian? Do you live like I lived upon this earth? So that is our challenge, our identification with Christ. And it brings me to my first point that I want to share this morning and that's our eradication. That is put to death Sexual sins, all right? Notice back here in our text, before we get to the list of five that he gives us, he says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. The New Living Translation translates it this way, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. That word, put to death, I know there's some translations that will use the word mortify. Now, we may not be real tuned in to the word mortify anymore, but we are tuned in to a mortuary, and we're tuned in to a mortician. And of course, that speaks of a place, uh, of course, a, a mortuary speaks of a place where the dead are put, okay? And a mortician is someone who handles the dead. So, in essence, what Paul is saying is that we need to put to death our old self. It's a process. Put it to death. Kill them, all right? Don't take any prisoners. Don't take any mercy on them. That's what Paul's commanded here in these verses that we want to look at. In other words, kill it before it kills you. And I'm going to give some examples here in just a minute regarding people who didn't do that. In other words, someone once said, be killing sin or sin be killing you. In fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, who died uh, in the regime of Hitler in Nazi Germany. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Die to yourself. When we were lost, we had no chance. We had no choice. We had no hope of changing ourselves and changing our lives and changing our attitudes and changing our actions. Now we have within us the spirit of the living God. We have Christ in us. And now we can overcome. You know, Paul identifies some specific sins that we should put to death. He calls a spade a spade. I knew a man that called a spade a spade until he hit his foot with it, and then he called it something else. But anyway, the Bible never blushes by saying exactly what God is talking about. And I'm going to go through this list that's found here. First of all, beginning in chapter 3 and in verse 5, and we read it just a minute ago, he mentions, notice, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness. Now, which is idolatry, he, he stipulates. Now, let's look at each one of these, all right? Because there's a process here. He mentions fornication. Fornication is kind of a, for lack of a better term, kind of a junk drawer word for all kinds of sexual immorality. Uh, the word, in fact, used there is pornea, all right, from which we get the word pornography from, which is writing two words, all right, speaking of 
graphe, which means to write, and poems, in, in this instance, speaking of, of course, here, he's speaking about all types of sexual immorality, whether it's premarital sex, homosexuality, bestiality, incest, prostitution, you name it, that word covers it, all right? A lot of time we say adultery means in a marriage when you have sex outside your marriage. Well, fornication also can include that and it's used sometimes in the Bible. So he uses that first. And then second of all, he mentions uncleanness, all right? And that means your thought processes. Remember, Jesus said it's not good enough not to just commit, in the instance, a sexual sin of adultery. He said, what are you thinking? In thinking it, thinking it, the thought is the father to the deed, amen? So here he's talking about, what about your thought life? What about the unclean thoughts that come into your mind? And you all know, as well as I know, television, media is bombarded Facebook, I mean, I, it's amazing. I'm just, I hardly ever communicate at all on Facebook. But uninvited, I get pictures that come on there, you know, of some offbeat site that I didn't ask for that comes on there that has suggestive uh, pictures and so on and so forth and trying to ensnare, trying to trap. So trying to get us to think unclean thoughts. And obviously, a lot of the, they say, sex sells. And obviously it does because that is the thing that they use so often to advertise their product. Even though their product may have nothing to do with a scantily clad girl that's, that's there representing their product. And then he mentions a third word. Notice passion. Passion. Interesting. You know, it's something that cannot be satisfied. Think about what he's saying here. You start out in this area, and you start out with fornication, and that's all these different types of sexual sin out there. Then the, you begin, the thought becomes the father to the deed, and then you want him to uh, carry this out, and then all of a sudden, if you carried it out, or if you realize, I can't stop thinking about this. That's what passion is. It's an insatiable desire that's out there that you've invited in. It's like trying to pour water into a cup that's got a hole in it. You know, people have that. We have that in all kinds of areas of our lives. And I've touched on this before. So many things. We've got a million of them. And we don't only need one. It's like one's too many and a thousand's not enough. And then a fourth thing he mentions here. It's just flat out evil desires. And I've shared before, so often we think of evil as just something, well, like going down to the mall in a mall in Texas, God help us. Yesterday, someone went down there and nine people were killed and many injured down there. And we see that person as evil as we should. But evil desires, you know, is desiring something that's forbidden. And the next thing he mentions is, is covetousness. And that is, you know, I want what you got. I want your wife. I want her for me or your girlfriend or whatever the case may be. I want her as my mistress. Or I, you know, it's amazing. We had a king coronated yesterday. The family, the family has a history of you know, sexual immorality. Here's the king. Here's the queen. And people know about their backgrounds. How that he'd had this affair. The queen was his mistress for several years when he was married to Lady Di. And their family is just filled with sexual immorality and everything going on. So he says here, you know, not wanting what someone else. He calls it idolatry. I want to show you a passage of scripture up here. On the screen. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. And let's put it in a different context than what we normally read. it. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies, notice this, as a living sacrifice. You know that head home back then when they would take something and they would take an animal and it would be represent them and it would be sacrificed to God. And he says... Take your bodies now as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, let's look at that from God's perspective. 
For instance, here's a, here's a couple, two 20-somethings, all right? They rent an apartment together. God sees that as a temple. He sees the bed as the altar, all right? And he sees what they do as sacrificing themselves to who? Well, not to him, but to their idol, to their God. And that's why he's mentioning these things because these things that he has just mentioned have become idols. They have become, this is what we worship because this is what we do. See, one of the key reasons I hope you come to church is because you are coming to worship your God. Your God. We have enough idol worship as it is. So we need to understand, as the Bible is so up to date, even though, even though so many want to call it old fashioned, think about how many sexual sins permeate, let's say, the church. The church. And how many people are really going to confess those to a minister or to a priest or whoever that religious figure might be? Oh, I can't do that. I saw just recently in scanning the headlines, October 22nd, all right, a former area youth pastor and college instructor accused of soliciting a 15-year-old girl for sex and paying her $500, according to the Arkansas document. I happened to have lunch, or breakfast, excuse me, with the pastor of that church. It was at the First Baptist Church in Diamond, Missouri. The current pastor there right now was not the one who was there when all of this was going on. What, what, this, young, what this man who, who is 44 years old, he had been the youth pastor at that church for 10 years. He left the church and now he was a tutor at NEO in Oklahoma. And he was paying a young man to be his lookout as he went and, again, had child pornography, was having sex with underage children. Think about a predator like that loose in your church, a fox in a hen house. You know, we wonder why just last year at the Southern Baptist Convention, we had this big expose of what was taking place in our own churches with these inordinate amount of people who were doing as this young man were and no one was saying anything and they were just going to the next church and the church that they were in was not blowing the whistle on them this kind of thing going on well it's not just evident with Baptist churches I look December 15th, former youth minister at St. Paul's Methodist Church in Joplin, all right, was brought and is going to spend six years in federal jail because he was exchanging pornographic images and videos with a child victim. This man is, was 25 years old, 25 years old. And then one final example I want to share with you. March 17th, and this was in the pathway that some of you I know here at the church get. One of our, and I recognize this man right off the bat when I seen the headline. What The headline said, former SBC pastor Johnny Hunt sues denomination he once led. Johnny Hunt, when we would go to the Southern Baptist Convention. He was always one of the main, oh, Johnny Hunt this, Johnny Hunt that. And he'd get up and he'd, you know, he was one of, when they'd have the pastor's conference, Johnny Hunt, he had been at Woodstock, Georgia for 30 some odd years. And he was always, you know, boy, he's the, he's the head and shoulders. He's the head honcho. He's the bell cow and so on and so forth. Well, when the Southern Baptist did this expose of, of, what was going on, they revealed that Johnny Hunt had had an inappropriate uh, relationship, whether it was once, and, and that was the claim, or however many times, it was revealed in this report. Well, once that came out, you know, Johnny Hunt's repetition went down the drain. Well, now Johnny Hunt is suing the SBC. He's suing the church. 
In fact, I want to read that article. I want to read just a clip from it that said, The decision to smear Pastor Johnny's reputation with these accusations has led him to suffer substantial economic and other damages. He lost his job and income. He's lost his current and future book deals. And he has lost the opportunity to generate income through speaking engagements. Johnny Hunt's 70 years old. How much more does he need? I mean, stop and think about it. It would be like if I got caught with my hand in the cookie jar and you blew the whistle on me and I'm going to sue you for telling on me. Even though the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And the first thing I thought of when I read that, if you've read your Bible, and I know Johnny Hunt has, how does he explain what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 where he says, we're not to take a brethren to court. Well, he's not only taking a brethren to court, he's taking the whole bunch to court. Now, Johnny Hunt got in trouble because of Johnny Hunt. And see, that's right at the heart of the problem. And the thing that blows my mind was when this indiscretion happened, it was right after the time that he was president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And you know what? He followed a man by the name of Frank Page who stepped down from his position and uh, he gave out his resignation. Everyone thought, well, Frank Page is retired. No, it come out that he had had an affair with someone. So here we have back-to-back -back presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention and two men who had served in their churches for years who had what? Succumbed to the very things that Paul describes here. And Paul over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3 says this. For, and he lists, again, talks about fornication and all clean, uncleanness and covetousness. Let it not be, notice this, let it not be once named among, among you as becometh saints. You know, if I would do as Johnny Hunt did, and Frank Page did, and Jimmy Swagger did, and Mr. Baker did, Jim Baker, and all this, what am I doing? If I'm saying I'm a Christian, I'm dragging the name of Christ through the mud like David did. Remember when David has his adulterous affair with Bathsheba? And I want you to see what Nathan said to him. And it applies as much today as it did then. Over in 2 Samuel he says, Nathan said to David, By this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You know when someone... So when someone in the Christian organization or a pastor or a leader, what have they done? Well, the media gets that, don't they? And then they sit back on their haunches and they say, yeah, I thought they were all phonies. I thought they were all fake. They're just as bad. They lust just as bad as anyone else. They have as many bad thoughts. They do as many bad actions as any of us. That Christianity stuff, it don't work. It don't work. There's evidence of it. That's exactly in the name of Christ gives it's drugged through the mud. And that's why Jesus said, or Paul says here, you know, be killing sin before it kills you. Stop it before it destroys you and your reputation. There's a second thing I want to mention here up here on the screen. And that's our motivation. And the motivation is a dandy one. The motivation is the wrath of God. Notice he says here, because of these things, that is not putting them aside, not burying them, not killing them, not mortifying them and destroying them. What happens? Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. See, sometimes, you know, yeah, we can escape, obviously, as far as losing our salvation, because that's not what this is about. We don't lose our salvation. But what happens is we're judged. We're judged as sons of disobedience. He says, in other words, don't become like the world because you'll be judged like the world will be. So you don't, you need to be very, very careful, all right? Very careful. In fact, you know the world in which we live in? They don't believe God's going to judge anything. 
Why do we do the things that we do? We don't believe there's going to be a payday someday. We don't believe there's going to be a day of reckoning. And that's why Paul in Galatians said the very thing. He said, you're just deceived. He said, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. But what? They're mocking God. God ain't going to do anything. He ain't going to do anything. Yes, he is. Notice, for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And of course, he goes on to say, you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. You sow to the Spirit, you'll reap of the Spirit. So that, again, is always the idea. Now think about it. He said in the first part of this chapter, he said, get your mind up there. Don't get it down here. Get it up there. Because stop and think. In the kingdom of God, a boyfriend and girlfriend going to rent an apartment? In, the, in, in heaven, in, the, in God's he, heaven, are, are there going to be pornographic materials up there? I mean, is there going to be fornication and adultery in heaven? Is there going to be sex trafficking in heaven? Is there going to be uh, lying and cover-ups and all of this stuff in heaven? Jesus says, you're not going to bring that in here. Get your mind out of the gutter. Get it where it should be. And I want you to see in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Again, as I emphasized when I read this originally. Once you were this way. Once it was like you had no control. you got a steering wheel now. You can have control. That was the old you. That was the way you used to live. You don't have to live that way anymore. In fact, David, after, he was, after his uh, sin with Bathsheba, an adulterous affair, he later wrote a psalm, Psalm 51. And in that, he wrote the words, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me. Now, Paul goes from sexual sins to social sins. Notice the third thing I want to share with you. Is what I call our elimination. Put off the social sins. Notice, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. I want to start off with, first of all, anger and then wrath. Anger and then wrath. Again, the idea is take those old clothes off. Take the old you. Put the new you on. The old you, oh, you got angry. Well, what's anger? Well, it's the starting point. Anger is an emotion so often that's just boiling underneath the surface, all right? We get mad at our situation. We get mad at our circumstance. We get mad at God. We get mad at everything. And anger, again, isn't always necessarily sin, sinful. It's just when it begins to be that sin of the flesh, that raginess of the flesh. In fact... He says here, he talks about in the second thing, he mentions wrath. That is when your anger is exposed for what it is. That's when people can see it now. And I want you to see what James said about that type of anger or malice, or excuse me, wrath. He said, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Notice, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I tell myself that a lot. I have to, all I have to do is watch the news sometimes. And here comes the wrath. Because I think, how can you people be so stupid? How, how can you... You know, we had a situation just this past week where a man was choked in a, uh, in a subway in New York. A man who had been 40 times had been arrested, brought charges, all right? And he was threatening people in the subway. He was still on the loose. Society would do nothing for him. They would not stick him in a jail and throw the key away. And so a Marine who grabbed him and held him, and he wound up dying, and now people are marching saying, you got to do something to this Marine. Do something, or we're going to burn her down. We're going to burn the town down. That's nonsense. That's crazy talk. And that shouldn't be allowed. But you keep seeing all of these areas that are taking place. So again, I have to remind myself, my anger is not going to make God react. It's not going to bring in His power in the situation. And then I want you to see, he goes on and he mentions malice. 
Go back in our text again. He mentions malice. That is when you go from, I'm angry. You see my anger now, the wrath, and now I'm going to do something. And you know what? Even to the point of killing. I'm going to, I'm going to hurt someone. That's what malice is speaking of here. It's, I'm going to get even. I'm going to do something. And I'm going to regret it later. And then he mentions blasphemy. And that's slander. That is, I'm going to slander you. I'm going to say bad things about you that I don't even know are true or not. But it's going to come out of my mouth. And what happens so often? When do normally people use filthy language? When they're angry, isn't it? When they're angry. That's when it comes out. You know, it's well said. What's down in the heart comes up in the bucket. Or down in the well comes up in the bucket. And what comes up? You know, these angry words, cursing and so on and so forth. And I love the old expression, profanity is the uh, feeble attempt of a weak mind to express itself forcefully. And that's really what it is. And he's saying here, that language should never come out of your mouth because you are a new person. Did Christ use that type of language? Did Christ use God's name in vain? Did Christ use curse words and profanity? Did he profane God's creation? You know, think about it. No matter how what I might think of you and what you ha may have done, if you're a ruthless serial killer, you're still made in the image of God. And I'm profaning God by using profanity. And so we think about, it. he goes on to say there in Colossians 3 and verse 9, he goes on to say, and do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds. I find it interesting that right after he talks about blasphemy and slander. He talks about don't lie. Because what? We live in a world. Now let's think of the world. He's wanting us to get our head up in heaven. Get it down on the earth. But earth it is. You stab me in the back. I'll stab you in the back. You lie against me. I'll lie against you. All you have to do. You know. You, all you have to do is, is think about how that's going on every day of our lives. There's lies being perpetrated out there. And he's saying, let me ask you, are there going to be any lies in heaven? Going to be any liars up there? How's, what's going, what about slander? Is going to be any slander taking place in heaven? Remember, he's saying, set your mind up there, not down here on the earth. Where is your residence? All right, you're down here, but your position is up there. And then there's a fourth and a final thing that I want to mention. And that is our transformation. God's great goal for me and God's great goal for you if you're a Christian. He wants you to be like Jesus. He wants to create you, recreate you in the image of Christ. You know, we've already talked about what's heaven going to be like. We're going to be like him. We're going to be like him. Hallelujah. We're going to be like Jesus. Now, he says here in, in this text, he says, Notice, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. That is, here we are, and he's saying, Hey, Ed, I want you to put on a uniform. I want you to put on Christ. The robe of righteousness. The garments of salvation. Ed, I want you to do that. I want you to be a light. Don't be part of the dark. There's already enough darkness in the world. Wherever you go, I want that to be a light. I want it to be a beacon. All right? I want you to be different than the world. I want you to put on. And in order for you to do that, Ed, like the Apostle Paul said, Paul said, remember, I die daily. I've got to keep taking that old Ed who wants to what? Get mad. Who might want to look at things he shouldn't look at. I've got to keep him again buried where he should be. Because that's not me anymore. I'm the new me. At least that's what, I'm tell that's what I'm telling people. That's what I'm saying. That is the way I used to think. Lord, I don't want to think that way anymore. That's the way I used to respond. I would respond in anger. I don't want to respond that way anymore. That's the way I used to act. Lord, I don't want to act that way anymore. Because I've been renewed. I've been born again. Now, I want to tell you something. We can't change ourselves. But he can. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, notice this, 
being confident of the very thing that he who began a good work in you. Who began it? He began it. We didn't. Oh, I got saved. I began a new work. I'm a new person. He began it. Notice, and he's the one that started it. And he's got to be the one to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, you realize that when you got baptized, and if you're here today and you were baptized, you realize you put on a new person? You put on Jesus. In Galatians chapter six, uh, chapter 3, I want you to see this. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have, notice this, put on Christ. You got a uniform. You got a uniform. In fact, one of your jobs is being a priest. Every one of us. Priest to the believer. We've got an opportunity. We make a statement. We've put on Christ. All right? And so we're different now. Baptism pictures to others that, hey, we've been saved. We're not the old Ed. I'm the new person. I've put on Christ. And then Paul ends this section. I go to it in, in, here in the, back in Colossians chapter 3. And I want you to see what he does here. Colossians chapter 3 and verse uh, uh, 11. Will you pull it? I think I put it as Romans. There it is. I, I put that wrong. That's my mistake. It's not Romans. It's Colossians. Where there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now I want you to see how he breaks this down. He says, in Christ, it's not about race. You know, the Bible only tell, tells us to clarifies and gives us two races, Gentile and Jew, Greek and Jew. And then it's not re regarding, we've already talked about circumcision or uncircumcised. In other words, it's not according to your devotion. It's not according to something that you've done physically that makes you different. It's not according to a barbarian or Scythian. And Scythians were a group of people that were the worst example you could give of someone who was a nomad, who was a barbarian. And then notice he says, slave nor free. And there were many slaves, and we'll get into that here in just a little bit back then. But notice, Christ is all in all. We, you know, Aaron talked about a few minutes ago about that song. That's why I wanted to, I, I quoted it in this message, because it's drawn from that passage of Scripture. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I'm dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. All right? Now, let me end with a final um, illustration this morning. And it's one I know you're familiar with. It's Lazarus. Lazarus. Lazarus was Jesus' good friend. And he died. And Jesus deliberately delayed his visit to Mary and Martha to go and respond to that. And remember what, in that story, and we'll quote the verse here in just a minute. But remember, he was wrapped up like a mummy in those death clothes. Those, you know, now we dress somebody up. Uh, because back then, you know, they didn't, like we do now, you know, like the... the uh, uh, mortuary, the funeral home, will embalm people. Well, the Jewish people didn't do that. They buried you within 24 hours, all right? And we read with, in Lazarus' case, that he was even beginning to stink, the Bible says. So they buried him quickly. He's wrapped, they mummified him, they would wrap him up and use those, uh, you know, the perfume and so on and so forth in their, in their uh, covering them up. And it's a description of sin. The wages of sin, remember, is death. You know something about you and about me. Every time I sin, I die a little. I'm making a deposit. You know, a wage. You know, at the end of the week, if you get paid once a week or you get paid every two weeks, what? You get your wage. You get your earnings. Every day of my life. And so are you. We are what? We are paying Paying the sins 
the wages of the sin of death. And every time we sin, a part of us dies. And what we do is we literally entomb ourselves. We make a mummy out of ourselves. Our, our sins become our burial cloth, all right? And in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, And you he made alive who were dead, dead, dead in trespasses and sin. You know, I've said it before, there's a fascination in our day and age with zombies. You know, here are these people walking around. Well, I'll tell you what. There's zombies all over this world in a spiritual sense. They're dead in trespasses and sin. And the only one that can raise them from the dead is Jesus. And in that example, I want you to see over, and we'll wrap, wrap up with this. In John chapter 11, the Bible says when Jesus there came, it says, Now when he had said these things, he being Jesus, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. So you can imagine the scene as he comes out. And he's like a mummy walking like this. And he says, Get those old clothes off of him. The clothes of death. Those clothes that stink, that mummy wrap, get it off of him and let him go. What, does, what happens when we become a Christian? We get our freedom back. We don't have to sin anymore. Now we can obey Jesus. Now we can follow him. We don't have to live like the world anymore. That, therefore, we can put our eyes up above. We can focus on heaven. We can focus on our final resting place. And it isn't it's six feet under. It's with Jesus. It's with him. So he's saying, don't let those old things, those old things that die, Jesus died to save you for, don't let them. Don't let them wrap you up. Don't let them take you back. Can you hear his voice? Can you hear his voice? You know, everywhere Jesus goes, he reverses death. Because he, remember, is the way, the truth, and the life. And his voice, his voice brings life. His touch brings life. And even his death, amen, brings life. Thank you for joining us for this powerful sermon on putting off the old, putting on the new. We pray that you've been inspired and encouraged to continue growing in your relationship with Christ, embracing the new life he offers, and seeking his guidance in all things. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more uplifting sermons. May God bless you as you walk in his love and grace. Amen.